So the topic of this debate is whether or not John seven fifty three through eight verse chapter eight verse eleven is authentic. This is commonly known as the pericope adultery and has been uh, doubted by many modern scholars of the Bible, both liberal and some somewhat more conservative. So right here we have, uh, you know, we have D. A. Carson. Daniel Wallace, Bart Ehrman, and Bruce Metzger all casting doubt on the pericope. But I will be showing that this is not an inauthentic verse. So alongside these scholars, we also have um, some Bible translators, like the NIV, the ESV, and so on, that say that this is inauthentic. And we have Anders, who says that anyone who believes this is stupid, right? So... I'll be tr I'll be trying to demonstrate today which view is the stupid one, and uh, to start, I'll make the positive case for the uh, the authenticity of the so-called pericope. So, what I'm not here to prove is that um, um, is uh you know whether or not it's just a nice story or something. I'm here to prove that Saint John wrote this. So to start with, I'm gonna send a manuscript into the chat. This is Codex Beze, which Bart Ehrman agrees is one of our earliest witnesses to the New Testament manuscript tradition. So this is commonly, well, it's not sending, but it should be sending soon. This is commonly uh, known as the uh, a, a Western manuscript. It's of the Western text type, the so-called Western text type, and it's uh, written around 400 to 500 AD, and it includes the um, pericope. And now, uh, of course, there will be many comments made about the Western text type. Some try and say that it's a fund of paraphrase, some try and say numerous things about it, and people usually defer to the Alexandrian text type as more reliable, but I will be showing today that there are better methods than simply just deferring to the Alexandrian text type and everything. So apart from the Western text type, what do we have? So we also have in the East a document called the Didascalia Apostolorum, which quotes this verse, or at least references it with authority. So it's exhorting bishops to be merciful, and it says, But he, the searcher of hearts, asked her, and said to her, Have the elders come then thee, my daughter? She saith to him, Nay, Lord, and he said unto her, Go thy way, neither do I condemn thee. So this is taken directly from the so-called pericope, from specifically John chapter 8, verse 3 to 11. So, a very clear witness. By the way, this document was written around 230 AD, before both Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus were compiled, and this was around this was around the Syrian area. Saint Epiphanius thought this was of apostolic origin, but that's not necessary to believe. What we need to know is that this is an early Syrian document. So this is clear proof that this existed before the Alexandrian text types in the East. So this is a strong evidence against the belief that it was uh, it was forged. So here's another specific witness who is really important because he is an Egyptian. So he would have been using the Alexandrian text types. His name is Didymus the Blind, and in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, he says we find in certain Gospels a woman, it was said, condemned by the Jews for a sin and was being sent to be stoned in the place that was for that. And then uh, the Savior, it says, when he saw her and observed that they were ready to stone her, said to those that were about to cast stones, he who has not sinned, let him take a stone and throw it, etc. So he's, he's, Didymus was blind, so he's not quoting this exactly. But it, he's saying that this is found in certain Gospels, clearly meaning certain manuscripts of the Gospel of John. So, uh, well, he doesn't say Gospel of John, but certain manuscripts of the Gospels, and we'll see that there's very good reason to believe it was in the Gospel of John and was later removed from certain manuscripts, not vice versa, and added in. And now we go back to the West, as we did with Codex Beze, and we have St. Passion. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but it's in the chat for anyone looking, and it says very clearly that, um, you know, he, we read in the gospel that the Lord spared even the adulteress who confessed when none had condemned her, and so on, right? So, it's very clearly referencing the story. And still in the West, we have St. Ambrose, who says, in Epistle 26, 
that this story is a very famous story. So Ambrose being a Western, right, also with uh, some correspondence in the East, he says very clearly that this is a famous story. So, so far we have numerous saints who are saying that this is an authentic story, or referencing it as such with no reason for doubt. Now here is a, a particularly important witness, St. Jerome. So St. Jerome says, it's sending, but he says that... Um, in the Gospel according to John, there is found in many of the Greek as well as the Latin copies the story of the adulteress who was accused before the Lord. He says this in against the Pelagians. So St. Jerome, when he was writing this, was it was very early 5th century. And another very important point for, from St. Jerome is that his Vulgate translation included this so-called story. It says... Um, you know, and in in the preface of the Gospels for the Vulgate, he says, only early manuscripts have been used. And because of the careless transmission of the old Latin text in some areas, he says that um, he used only, he compared them with the Greek manuscripts and only early ones have been used to, to, to uh, keep the accuracy and not change the meaning. So if he is saying that... Um, Assuming that many is more than nine, which is the number that people who are against the so-called pericope usually pull up to try and say that it's not authentic, he is saying that there were many early ones at his time. So if they are ancient for him, then they are, they are older than the Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, and they're in Greek. So they outweigh the amount of manuscripts that are against the, the authenticity of the pericope than the amount of that uh, supposedly show that it's fake, right? So um, we we can we also move on to uh, sorry give me a moment this is not very easy to keep sending like this all right so Saint Augustine we move on to Saint Augustine and he's writing in the uh, in the West as well and he says specifically that because of some people with weak faith who would not be willing to forgive their wives if they had committed adultery like this, they were removing these from the manuscripts, right? I would say that this, coupled with the fact that um, people in the, the East had already started to omit the, the so-called pericope, not intentionally, I would add, which we will get to, because it is true that this pericope, so-called pericope, is missing from the Alexandrian text type. However, it's not missing from the Byzantine text, the received text, and it's not missing from the Western, so-called Western, slash Caesarean text type. So, uh, I think from these early witnesses and other considerations, it is very, very safe to assume, not even safe, I think it's very clear that this is of apostolic origin. This was written by St. John the Apostle. This clear, beautiful example of the mercy of our Lord was not a later addition. It was not a floating anecdote, right? Now, we will get into many questions. Why was it removed from the early manuscripts? Why is it not found in the uh, Alexandria text type? Why was it moved around? Because this James White says that this is a clear example that it's a later addition. That it was moved around. Sometimes it's found at the end of the Gospel of John. Sometimes at the beginning. Sometimes after some preceding verses and before. Right? But I would just admit, because of, uh, for the sake of time, I don't have too much now, that this is not due to it being a floating anecdote. This is due to it being being moved around because of the election cycles in the early church. So specific saints had specific feast days and, you know, uh, certain events like Pentecost, Easter, Christmas, such Advent, so on, had specific readings as well. So the Pentecost reading for, um, for the Gospel of St. John, or the, the reading for the, for the Pentecost election, was St. John's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 35 to 52, through verses 8 to 11. So for the Pentecost election, the pericope is skipped. Now... I don't want to refute Anders' arguments before he makes them, but I'm just going to say that in the Alexandria text and in some other texts, these manuscripts were misunderstood. The marks on the manuscripts were misunderstood. Instead of them, because they were for lecture, lectors to skip over the text and to carry on reading at verse 8 to 11, some very meticulous Alexandrian scribe misunderstood these for marks of omission and just omitted them. And then people followed it. And we will see that this is a much simpler explanation than uh, 
many liberals that I was going to give. Thank you. That concludes Xavier's opening statement. Anders, you'll now have 10 minutes for your opening statement. As soon as you begin, I will start the timer. Okay, perfect. Well, welcome to this debate. I thank you, Xavier, for coming. Thank you, Pope Tachi, for modding as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I appreciate you presenting all these arguments. I'm not going to refute them yet because I'll save that for the rebuttal period, but I'll be going over all the evidence that it was not of Yohanine origin or it was not authentic. First of all, it's omitted from our earliest and best manuscripts, Papyrus 66, Papyrus 75, Papyrus 39, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, um, Codex Washingtonianus. Um, it's also omitted by several fathers and early witnesses, right? I sent a, I sent a list there of some significant witnesses. Um, it's omitted by Tertullian, John Chrysostom. Um, it's omitted by the, the Diatessaron as well. Um, so yeah, um, he listed some, he listed, he talked about Codex Beze, he talked about Augustine, Passion, Ambrose, and Jerome, which I'll respond to in the rebuttal period because I have, um, I, I've written like, uh, little sections in, in my opening, or my rebuttal, my rebuttals, um, to those. Um, Papyrus 39, I want to talk about that for a minute because it's not actually, it's not actually, it doesn't actually have the text of John 7, 53 through 8, 11, but I'll send an image of it. It has the text of John 8, 14 through 18, but if we assume due to like the space scene and we calculate, um, um, and we calculate like, like what the, the spacing would have been, if it would have been an at your average Greek codex, um, which has three, it's three, it's three columns, um, then it would not have been able to fit, um, on that page. Um, either that or the scribe was just a really bad one, right? Um, so yeah, uh, here's an image of... Codex, uh, or not Codex, sorry, but part 66, you can see here, I'll send a transcription as well. It completely skips. You can see it completely skips. Um, I believe it's the second line down. It skips from verse 53 to verse 12. Actually, real quick, go to general. I forgot to do this. Put a one in the chat if you think that this is authentic. Real quick. I just want to see how much bias we have. One, 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 zero, zero, one, one. Yeah, so it looks like we have a decent amount of bias here. All right. Um, anyways, I'll continue. Next up is, uh, by the way, that, that dates to uh, general dating is 125 to 150 AD. Next up is uh, Codex, or not Codex, uh, sorry, Papyrus 75. If you go to the 10th line down, you can see it completely skips over. Right. And you may say, oh, what about the spacing? Well, we can still look at the text, right? or not spacing, sorry. Uh, what about like the holes in the manuscript? We can still see the text. If you go 10 lines down, you can see there, the text is clear that it skips over it. There would be no room either way. And there's a transcript of it. In, in conclusion, when it comes to papyrus manuscripts, all papyrus manuscripts that include the ending of John 7, and the beginning of John 8 do not include the pericope. Okay, that's very, that's, that's very interesting. Next up, um, a major witness is Codex Sinaiticus, which is mainly Alexandrian, but it does have some Byzantine readings in it. Um, 12 columns down on the uh, middle col or third column. Here's the transcript. Um, it completely omits it, doesn't even give a clue towards it. Next up is uh, Codex Vaticanus as you can see here, also completely omits it, the third column, right? Uh, the middle column, sorry, uh, three lines up from the bottom. Here's the transcript. It completely omits it, just jumps over it. Here's another early witness. Um, uh, classified as uh, uh, Gregory Allen 029. Dates to around the 5th century. Here's the transcript. It completely skips over it. Um, when it comes to Codex Alexandrinus, another early witness, which is somewhat Western, somewhat it's sort of mixed, it's ecletic, um, but the page is missing between John 650 and John 852. Um, but however, we would assume that it wouldn't be there because Codex A has two columns and it couldn't possibly fit. Um, when it comes to Codex Ephraim Scriptus or Codex C, 
Um, the page is also missing between John 7, 3 and John 8, 34, but it's also not physically possible for the pericope to fit in between these. Tertullian never cites it. Many major early witnesses don't cite it. None of the apostolic fathers cite it. Cyril of Alexandria skips straight from verse 52 to verse 12. John Chrysostom, surprisingly, also skips over it. The reason I say surprisingly is because he's a Byzantine father. He's been, he, he quotes Acts 8.37. He quotes Matthew, 20, or Matthew 17.21, which are both um, Byzantine, Byzantine. They're both found majority in the Byzantine text. It's not in the Alexandrian or the Western. Um, however, he still quotes them, but he completely skips over the pericope. Um, uh, let's see. How much time do I have? Four minutes. Four minutes. Seconds. All right, perfect. Um, Four minutes, 30 seconds. All right. Um, Euthymius, who is... Uh, Bruce Metzger said, he, he often says this, he says, no father... Uh, cites it before the 12th century, which is obviously false, but here's the guy he's talking about, Euthymius. Um, in his commentary on the Four Gospels, page 129, he essentially, I'm not going to read it because I don't have a lot of time, but he essentially says that it's omitted uh, from the best manuscripts. Um, Augustine, yes, he does quote it, but the interesting thing about his quote is this. Uh, in, on, in his book on adulterous marriages, 2.7, he says, but apparently... Uh, but this apparently frightens the unbelieving senses, so that some of little faith, or rather enemies of the true faith, I believe, fearing that uh, by the forgiveness of the adulteress, the Lord has given immunity to their wives to sin, remove it out of their manuscripts, as if he gives permission to sin, who said, from now on, sin no more. I can't blame, right, I did say whoever believes this passage blatantly is stupid, right? But I can't blame Augustine, because he lived in an area where... Um, the manuscripts would have majority had the per, uh, the pericope, right? So I don't blame him for for doing that, right? He's not a stupid man. He's an intelligent man, but he he just didn't have resources um that included. He he didn't have uh, enough resources that included it. Um, but yeah, another thing he says this is he blatantly says it's a pit. It's it's his own opinion. It's not facts because he says I believe, right? He says blah blah blah. I believe this happened, right? So it's his opinion. It's not, it's not actually what ha would have happened, right? But he again, Augustine uses Lat used Latin manuscripts, um, and he said I believed, which basically means that, you know, he that was just the materials he had, um, and in his quotes on his tractate thirty three, I'll send it. The interesting thing is he includes, um, what the scribes and the uh, chief priests would have thought. It says, he is accounted true, he appears to be gentle, an accusation must be sought against him in respect of righteousness, uh, yada, 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 right? You can read the rest. I put it in brackets, but he includes that in the text when he's quoting it. He says, the scribes thought, this was the, these were the thoughts about Jesus from the scribes, and he inserts it. Um, so yeah, I would ask you, when you say the pericope is authentic, which, which one? Right. You have Augustine's quote, you have Ambrose's quote, um, you have Codex Beze, you have certain manuscripts that don't even include verses 53 through verse 1, you have certain manuscripts that only include um, verses 9 through 11, right? So which one is it? Which pericope? Um, also, Augustine in his quote, he omits uh, the first half of verse 7, part of verse 9, and, and the first half of verse 10. Um, Didymus the blind, you already cited him. But the interesting thing is, he says we find in certain Gospels which strengthens my case because that means it's in multiple Gospels. It could be in Gnostic Gospels as well, which does prove that this was sort of a floating text, right? Um, but I wouldn't use that as my main argument. Um, he also says in his quote here, I'll send the quote real quick. He says, it says, when he's referring to the story, right? It says when he saw her, not John says or the Apostle says. He says, it says. So it's a very vague, uh, vague quote. I wouldn't recommend using it. Here's the quote from Ambrose of Milan. He did write to Irenaeus, who it wasn't the same one, but um, yeah, basically, um, uh, there's nothing really to say about this. I would admit that he did accept it to an extent, right? It's it's somewhat different because um, it says in it says in the quote, and as they waited for his answer, he lifted up his head and or sorry, it says as they continued to ask him. That's what it says in our modern Bibles in verse 7. But in his quote, it says, as they waited for his answer, he lifted up his head and said, dot, 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 right? Um, 
I'll go over the grammar real quick, and then that will be my final state. Uh, my final statement. Uh, in John eight one. Uh, in John. All right. In John eight one, it's uh the Greek says El Elia, right, which means olives. Here I'll send it. Um, and it, he it's never used again in John. Another word that's used in John eight two is athros. It means early in the morning. It's not used by John again. And furthermore, in John 8, 18, 28, and John 20, verse 1, he uses the verb proe, which which also means the same thing, right? Uh, Pargenomai, uh, which I'll send real quick, meaning he came, is only used in Luke and 1 Timothy, um, right? And and John uses the word uh, archeomai um, in his gospel um, 18 times, so... Uh, which means the same thing, by the way. And then just one, uh, one more in John eight nine, he uses the the verb, uh, or he uses the word, archeomenai, um, or menoi, sorry, um, and it uses it. It isn't used by John again anywhere in the New Testament. Um, and in John one one, John one two, John six sixty four, and and elsewhere, he uses the word arche um, instead of that uh, to refer to beginning. But there's many more. I'll send a list real quick. Um, that I've cataloged. But your time for speaking is up now. All right, thank you. So we're going to now move on to the 10 minute rebuttals, starting with Xavier's rebuttal for Andrews. And Xavier, I have the timer ready. So whenever you're set to go, just let me know and I'll start the timer. All right, yeah. So uh, as I expected from Anders, no offense to him, he brought forth the same outdated amateurish arguments that Bruce Metzger used. So it's omitted from early manuscripts. Yeah. In Alexandria, as I said, it's not omitted in Syria. It's not omitted in the West. It's not omitted in many other places. St. Jerome, if we are going to have any faith in history, he says explicitly that this is found in many Greek and Latin manuscripts that were ancient for him. Now, if it's ancient for St. Jerome, it's definitely ancient for us, and it's definitely much older than Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and these other manuscripts, right? So, of course, the usual nine manuscripts that, you know, they always quote, P66, P75, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, Alexandrinus, and then Codex C, M, T, and W, right? Of, of these nine, only six of them are relatively early anyway, and... Uh, well, and sent a good uh, a few pictures of them. So with P sixty six, P seventy five, uh, Sinaiticus Vaticanus, as I said, there is a good explanation as to why these were removed. So in the early church, we even see this in the writings of Saint Methodius and uh, Origen as well. He said they say that um, there were specific elections or specific readings for specific saints and events. So, as I said, which, well, I mean, I didn't expect him to respond because it's his opening, but as I said before, the Pentecost election for, um, from St. John's Gospel was chapter 7, 35 to 52, and then it skips exactly where the pericope is and goes to verse 8 to 11. So these were marked on early manuscripts with asterisks, right? I, because of, you know, a few factors and the technical difficulties that we had, I can't send them here. But they were asterisk. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. So some scholars try and interpret this, usually Protestants, to don't understand the lectionary cycles of the early church, or lection readings at least. They don't understand that these were to signify what was read on specific days. So because the... Um, so-called pericope was skipped at Pentecost, this was marked. Now, as I said, a meticulous Alexandrian scribe would have seen these marks that signify, um, for, that show for a lector to continue reading where the marks, the next marks are, basically. They would have confused that and just deleted the manuscript from, I mean, the, the so-called pericope from the text. This explains why it was removed relatively early in the Alexandrian textual tradition very well, and it also explains why it was moved to, uh, well, Anders didn't really bring that up, surprisingly, but anyway, it, it explains why they were moved. We can touch on that if it comes up. So as I said specifically, St. Pelagia's feast day, um, for her feast day, which was on October 8th, her reading was from the so-called pericope. It was from John 8, verses 3 to 11, or give or take one or two verses, basically. So because of that, it would also be marked, which is why some of the manuscripts, I believe Anders briefly brought that up when he was shotgunning points, but for like a second when he brought it up, 
that's why some manuscripts include John 7.53, then they include, include verses 1 and 2, but they remove verses 3 to 11. So a lot of these witnesses that are cited, and by the way, the vast majority of the manuscripts have this over the... Um, the ones that don't. Only 200 and something don't have this. Over a thousand have the so-called pericope in its uh, manuscripts. So, of the manuscripts that, um, with regard to, yeah, that the verse, that have the first two verses, um, not all of them remove the entire pericope, basically. So, are we going to doubt part of the pericope, but not the whole thing, because some manuscripts keep the pericope in? It's, it's just a mess. If you're going how and why this verse, this so-called pericope ended up where it is, and the exact wording and so on, uh, I don't know if my, my internet is bad right now. Yeah, you are cutting up a bit, but um, it's only been for the past. But if it so. is, just unmute and tell me, please. And um, yeah, he said it was omitted by Tertullian, John Chrysostom, and. Uh, Okay, uh, can you pause the timer, please? I, I'll try and sort that out. Yeah, uh, the pause. Is it better now? It should be. Uh, yeah, I could hear you clearly there. I'll let you know if it persists, though. Um, okay, you're just... Ready. Tell me as soon as... Possible. You're cutting out. Yeah. yeah, you're cutting out again. All right, I will start. All right, sorry about that. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, it's better. All it's right. Better. Yeah, uh, I'll just I'll carry on where I was uh, where I was before. All right. So yeah, so um, yeah, Anna said it was omitted by Tertullian, Chrysostom, and the Diatessaron. Yeah, it was omitted by Chrysostom as far as we can see. However, he was clearly using a text that was influenced by the Alexandrian text type. So Tertullian, I'm not aware of him omitting it. I mean, I'm not even sure if he commented on this. And to say that it was omitted by all the apostolic fathers is kind of ridiculous, because we barely have any of their writings, and if we're going to go by that, then most of the Bible is inauthentic, because they don't quote most of it. So it's a ridiculous point to bring out the apostolic fathers. But of what we do have, they do quote from um, other places, that is true. But they don't quote from the whole Bible. It's a uh, kind of a silly point. But anyway, the Diatessaron. So the Diatessaron does not include it, almost definitely because it was influenced by an Arabic slash Syriac uh, recension. But Codex Fordensis in its chapter titles does speak of the existence of this. And that uh, the, the old Latin that that is based on clearly does have some uh, uh, correlation with Tatians of Diatessaron. So if that if that could hold water, then we do have precedent that an earlier version of the um, the the mother manuscript, basically that Codex Fudensis was based on, did include the um, the so-called pericope, which would make that very early because Codex Fudensis is around a fifth sixth century document, right? fifth sixth century manuscript. So yeah, he spoke about the early papyri. I've already mentioned that, and then. Um, yeah, so it's missing in Alexandria, right? He keeps saying, oh, it's missing from our earliest and best manuscripts. Early and best according to who? According to Westcott and Hort, who just kind of uh, arbitrarily said the Alexandrian text types are the best and we just we just can't, you know, go against them. Or according to what Bart Ehrman or Bruce Metzger, we don't just go with this... Uh, we don't just uh, take this weird kind of eclecticism and just go with these manuscripts that we think are the best and ignore the rest. It's a ridiculous uh, position to take because all of the early historical data shows that the pericope is a very early and ancient um, uh, it's an ancient part of John's Gospel. So to say that it's um, 
it's not found in these manuscripts that we particularly like. And by the way, the the uh, the basis of believing that these are the best manuscripts are just, is very tenuous anyway. It's just arbitrary and it's silly. So obviously, we know that the um, the Alexandrian text type is not the best because it uh, has a. Uh, some readings that we don't we don't even use at all today, right? For one example would be that comes to the top of my head. There are others, but one example would be like Second Peter one verse one, right? So the Codex, I mean Codex Sinaiticus says, "Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ." The most ancient reading and the reading that basically all translators use today says, "Our God and Savior Jesus Christ." That's just one example, there are other examples as well. And on top of that, those manuscripts have distinctly Byzantine readings. So P66 in John 10.19 and John 10.31 has distinctly Byzantine readings, not Alexandrian. So as we can clearly see, I mean, these, these manuscripts, there's too much weight being put on them almost arbitrarily, right? And then he goes on to say, yeah, he said that it's stupid to believe this, but Augustine just didn't have resources or something. But the issue is, Jerome, who was a good friend of Augustine, did have the resources. And he told us the most ancient copies that he had, and the most accurate ones, which he put in the Vulgate, they include, many of them, Greek and Latin, include the pericope. That's why he put it in the Vulgate. So the question is, are we going to throw out all of the data we have because of what? nine, not even nine, six Egyptian manuscripts that we really like and ignore St. Jerome saying that there are many ancient manuscripts that have this in it. I need to keep pushing that point on because it's like, it's ridiculous to me. It's absurd, right? And then, um, yeah, Didymus says we find we do find it in certain Gospels. Uh, saying that it means Gnostic Gospels is arbitrary. He was a uh, son of the church as far as he thought himself to be. He did not want to just say that uh, any Gospels were Gospels. He was blind, but he wasn't an idiot. So it wasn't, it wasn't from Gnostic Gospels. And what he meant by certain Gospels is clearly certain copies. Because there's no evidence, as we can see, to, to say that it, weren't, it was in any other Gospels. It was clearly in the Gospel of St. John and moved because of the lectionary readings. And when it was moved, it wasn't moved outside of St. John's Gospel except to the beginning slash the end of uh, St. Luke's Gospel. But I mean, he didn't bring that up. I'm not going to refute a point he didn't bring up. And then he conceded on Ambrose, which is good. And uh, he brought up the internal evidence with words, which is absolutely ridiculous because then we're going to have to throw out John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, which uses an extremely high amount of unique words, and no one doubts this part. These linguistic arguments are specious and amateurish. Like, they should really not be used at all. And plus, I don't have much time now, but just with the text in the, um, where it's supposed to be, uh, John 7, 53 through 8 to 11, it makes much more sense, because if not, it's just like the Pharisees have a private meeting, and then they teleport, and they're talking to Jesus. I mean, anyway, I don't have much time, but yeah. Thank you. I think my time is up. I don't know what your time is saying. I paused the time for you when you were uh, having the connection issue. How Thanks. much do I have on your end? Uh, only 10 seconds. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to be getting into Anders's 10 minute rebuttal. So, Anders, I have the 10 minute timer here and ready. Just tell me when you're ready, and I'll start it as soon as you start speaking. I'm ready. Okay. All right. So, I'll deal with your objections because I wrote, I wrote them down. I'll deal with them going like the ones you just said go into all the way to the beginning, right? So the, the last one I wrote down, you said no evidence it was in un, any other Gospels. What about the Gospel according to the Hebrews? What's our, what's interesting to me is that you didn't bring up Papias's quote, which sort of proves that it was floating, right? It was floating among Gospels. Or Papias says that it was written in the Gospel according to the Hebrews, right? What about the Gospel according to the Hebrews? Um, Some grammar, Um, this is noted by certain scholars, but some grammar... Um, used in, in the pericope actually is more Lucan than Yohanine. So some people think that it was taken from an L source or a Lucan tradition and just sort of merged in there. So it could have come from, you know, Luke, right? Not I'm not saying it was in the Gospel of Luke. I'm just saying it was, there's a lot of um, Lucan like language. If you, I looked at the Greek, I studied the Greek and I can confirm that's true. Um, let's see what else. 
Um, yeah, I could tell you've been reading James Snap because you brought up um how Codex or P P sixty six has um two Byzantine readings. Um, that's pretty good. Glad you've been doing your research. Um, Second Peter one one sort of irrelevant. Um, but yeah, the evidence sort of points towards Lord, but we can discuss this later. But I would say God because obviously Papyrus two uh seventy two says uh God Christ right. Um, you kept stressing uh, lectionaries or lections, right? Which is essentially manuscripts of, of the New Testament, but they were written in a way for like uh, that, that they would read in church ecclesiastically. Um, I would ask you, why don't the Byzantine lectionaries skip over the passage if that's just what they did back then, right? I'd also ask you, what's your evidence that Papyrus 66, Papyrus 75, etc. What's your evidence that uh and on all in the great codices the great five unseals what's your evidence that they uh were lectionaries you have no evidence otherwise they would have been skipping over um certain lections left right and center right um you also have no evidence that there was a clumsy alexandrian scribe because the text was controlled this is what um uh dan wallace and and william mounts say um so they constantly stress this point the alexandrian text was controlled so obviously, if a scribe takes takes this out on accident because it's election, right? Because the text is hello? controlled. Wait, hello. Hello. Yeah, sorry about that. I cut out for like the last fifteen seconds. You said, I mean, I don't want to interrupt, but you said, uh, Alexandrian yeah, scribe. Time here, for right? interjection, Xavier. So what do you said? say? I said now isn't the time for interjection. <laughs> no, I so timed out. I lost connection. I lost connection. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying I heard Alexander scribe uh, Bruce, Ma not Bruce Maska, uh, James Wallace. No. Uh, are you asking for him to repeat it? Yeah, if you can. Yes, that would be I, nice I would to love to repeat it. I'd love to repeat it. I'll reverse your time, Anders, to where you were at then. All right, tell me. Actually, I'll just start. Um. So, yeah, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Um. Right. The Alexandrian text was controlled. Dan Wallace and William Mount stress this all the time in their books about textual criticism. The Alexandrian text was controlled. That's why we have less variants, not just because we have less manuscripts in the Alexandrian text type. It's because we have um, less variants that proves that the text was controlled. So if it was an accidental uh, election, it was an omission because of election, electionary, right? The scribes would have noticed that they because the text is controlled. They would have used multiple manuscripts, at least one of these early texts, right? They're not just limited to one manuscript, right? Let's say Papyrus 66 was limited to one manuscript. Papyrus 75 probably wasn't limited to one manuscript, probably had a lot of manuscripts. Same with Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, right? But what also, I have another question. What makes you think that the Alexandrian text is going to be limited to Byzantine lections? What makes you think that? There's no evidence for that. Um, so yeah, that's a moot point. Um, let's see what else. Um, oh yeah, when it comes to the, when it comes to the Latin, cause you brought up Codex Valdensis, I believe, um, uh, the oldest, um, the oldest manuscript of the Vulgate that we have, or the oldest gospel manuscript of the Vulgate that we have, um, Codex Sagalensis 1395, uh, which is dated to the fifth century. It doesn't even include the Pericope right um codex brixianus which is dated to the sixth century also doesn't have it that's written in latin it's latin vulgate um codex Curiensis, which is also dated to the fifth century does not include it codex veronensis which is also dated to the fifth century doesn't even include it and it's also latin um i have a screenshot of that or i have an image of that sorry uh just give me a minute all right anyways um Codex Versalensis, which is written in Old Latin, dated the oldest of, of our Latin, dated the 4th century, doesn't include it. I also have an image of the folio. It's a transcription. Sorry, I clicked I clicked the wrong VC. Can you, like, restart my time? I, was, I accidentally clicked the VC instead of the chat. Yeah, I can reset it. All right, thanks. How much time do I have, by the way? Uh, now you have six minutes and 20 seconds. All right, perfect, perfect. All right. Um, yeah, you didn't respond to my grammar objection. 
right? The fact that, um, right, in John 8, 9, Sunni Desis, the, the verb Sunni Desis, that's not used in any of the four Gospels. It's not used in John, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. I'll send it in debate evidence. That's the verb used in John 8, 9. Um, verses, in verses 5 through 11 and 9 through 11, the conjunction day is used. But this is not, it's not Yohanan for it to be used six in six verses constantly. The record of, uh, I believe it's in John 6, it uses it two verses in a row, like 42 and 43 or something, right? It never is used three to six times in a row. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, what else? Let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Grammatais, uh, which is used in John 8, 3, refers to the scribes. It's never used again by John, and John never references these people, right? So I'd like you to explain the list that I'm given. This isn't even all. I spent like an hour and 30 minutes cataloging. And, and in John 8, 2, by the way, there were like um, literally every single word was not Yohanan, but I spent like an hour and 30 minutes cataloging over 20 different 20 different verbs and adjectives and adverbs that are never used by John in, in, in his gospel, not even in his epistles or revelation. Um, so, yeah, you didn't explain those. Um, uh, let's see what else. I already responded to the election. Oh yeah, uh, the 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 Diatessaron proves that um, the Syriac, the most reliable Syriac manuscripts and Arabic manuscripts didn't include it. Um, but I forgot to mention in my opening statement when we look when when we we're determining whether or not a passage or a story is authentic or a pericope is authentic, we go by manuscripts, then we go by versions, then we go by patristics. It's not the other way around. You don't get to take patristics over over the, the manuscripts we have. Manuscripts must be weighed, not counted. That's why I accept the Alexandrian text type. We also have a stable text in the Alexandrian text type. That's also why I accept it. There's many other reasons, but those are the main two. So yeah, you're you're sort of like like uh J. Harold Greenlee says in his book, An Introduction to New Testament Textual Criticism. He says, um he 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 writes about this a lot, but he says, um, patristics are like a third hand source. Right. Manuscripts are first hand um, versions or like uh, languages, different languages, not Greek, like Latin and Ethiopian and et cetera. Um, those are secondary. Right. And then the patristics come in. But then you also have to prove that the patristics are preserved. But for the sake of the argument, I'll just let you run with it. Um, yeah. Again, why don't any apostolic fathers quote it? If adultery was, was stressed so much as a sin, that's why it's also stressed as a sin in... Um, in, in the in the didache it stresses us in um in, in chapter one and chapter three i believe um but if it's if, if that's such a big sin right it is today but they stress how big of a sin it was back then if that's such a big sin then the apostolic fathers surely should be quoting it right i see your point about john three but every single father quotes like let's i'll even include the second century fathers not just Irenaeus, polycarp quadratus um and and all the other apostolic fathers we can we I'll, I'll i'll make it more broad i'll go up to the second century no second century father references it and this is a problem right um uh because it's such a big and and according to ambrose it's such a famous story or according to ambrose and jerome it's such a famous story if it's such a famous story they should be citing it left right and center but they're not um you said that they were early elections were marked yeah we don't have the we don't have the exemplar of Papyrus 66 and 75 and all the other um, unseals that I that I would use to disprove the authenticity of the uh, pericope. Um, so yeah, we, we don't know that for sure. Um, um, let's see, what else? Um, I already talked about all the, all the fathers, so I don't need to do that again. Um, uh, oh yeah, you can appeal to Byzantine manuscripts all day, that's fine. But then it comes down to this. It comes down to the question of which text type is authentic is it the alexandrian is it the byzantine is it the western or caesarean which one is it thank you all right we're now going to be entering our period of 40 minute cross-examination starting with xavier's 10 minute cross-examination now for your information during this time short interjections are allowed so anders you're allowed short interjections usually five to 20 seconds of time and xavier during anders's time you'll be allowed the same so xavier are you ready 
Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for that. I mean, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying this to be rude, but I'm genuinely shocked at some of the comments you made. Frankly, I, I want to I want to ask questions about those. Before. I had some questions, but I'll ask some questions about what you just said first. So you said that the 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 Byzantine lectures do not skip the passage. Are you aware of the countless manuscripts of the Proslogion and the Monologion that we have that all say the Pentecost reading is John seven verse thirty five to fifty two, and then it skips to eight eleven? We have so much evidence that that's the case. Yeah, that was my bad. I did mess up there. I just actually realized that when I finished. Um, I'll clarify what, what I meant to say. I meant to say, and I'll save this question for when I get to ask you questions, but I meant to say, this was my main point. Why do the Byzantine um, lections affect the Alexandrian lections? Why do the lections in Rome and that area affect the lections down in, in Egypt and Alexandria? Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I know it's not your time to Arts about. I'll just say very briefly because East and West generally had a similar cycle. I mean, East had a similar cycle, West had a uh, similar cycle. But anyway, um, you you said the gospel according to Hebrews, and uh, you brought up Papias. So with Papias, are you aware that Eusebius does not quote him specifically saying that um, this was a woman caught in adultery? He said a woman caught in many sins, and many scholars say that this is not he's not talking about the exact same story yeah well doesn't the doesn't don't some latin manuscripts say adultery you actually told me that so yeah the Ruf, rufinus's manuscripts rufinus of aquileia he translated it as adultery why but what we have in eusebius which came earlier is in greek and it says woman caught in many sins so it's a moot point well actually no it, it wasn't it wasn't written in in, well, it was written in Greek, but the earliest manuscript we have is from the fifth century. Um, it's about a hundred year, one hundred twenty years removed, and it's it's in Syriac. So the Syriac is most reliable. I'd have to look at the yeah, Syriac. What is you see, just wrote in Greek. But anyway, um, you said you looked at the Greek, and you know, it's like whatever. It's your opinion. But then you brought up this grammar argument again. Are you aware of the? Let me just put it up very quickly. Because this is a a very very strange comment for someone who has actually. Because you, you've looked at this, I know you've looked at this, and I'm surprised you'd make the same argument again when I just addressed it. But um, are you aware of the very, very, very high proportion of unique words that come in 190 segments, uh, word segments of text? Because, you know, yes. the so-called pericope is 190 segments. Are you aware that if we do that for the Gospel of St. John, we're going to be saying every 190 word segment is not by St. Yeah, John? Yeah, but the problem because... is, if you look at oh, certain... Yeah, so you are aware. Yeah, yeah, but here, let me say so this. So it's a specious the... argument. Well, no, no, it's okay. not. Let, let me say this. If you see this con inconsistent inconsistency of grammar, right this many times in literally every verse, then that sort of begs the question, was this written by John, right? If you see the conjunction day being used in six verses in a row, and it's only used, the, the, the maximum is in John 6, and it's used, I believe it's verses 42 and 43, the conjunction day is used two verses in a row, but six, that's never seen, not, I would actually challenge you to show me, from between the Gospel of John, his first, second, and third epistles, and Revelation to show me where he does that. Even though I don't believe this, I don't believe the same John yeah. wrote second, third John Revelation, but that's a different topic. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. But the the this is like someone picking up my uh, a text message that I wrote and snipping off one part and snipping off the other part, and the style is slightly different because you know for some reason maybe I could have been talking to someone. I'm not saying that's what Saint John was doing and saying, oh look, he he used some more words here, therefore he couldn't have wrote it. It's yeah, but John ridiculous. John is Wait, hold consistent on. Hold on, with his hold grammar. On. I'm not done. I'm not done. I wanted to ask you a question. So, in John, verse. Uh, St. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. Are you aware that Alan Johnson says that there is an extremely high proportion of once used words here? Are you aware that he says that? Yeah, but it's there. different, no, though. Pull them up. How many? It's different. How you'd have different? to actually, How's... first, you'd have to show me how many words. Second, you'd have to show me inconsistent patterns. Third, that's not, there's not as many no, this verses is all, as the These are all just pay. arbitrary criteria. The fact of the matter is that there is a high proportion of once used words here, yet no one doubts this part. You don't doubt it. I don't know any scholar in the world who doubts John 2, 13 to 17 as being Which authentic. words? 
Like it, it's not your time to ask questions. But anyway, um, yeah. And then you said uh, the Alexandrian uh, scribes were not clumsy. Yeah, I agree. Of course, they weren't clumsy. That's why when they saw those marks that were for lections, they removed them. Did you understand that point? Yeah, but where? Can you show me the original election marks? Are I mean, this is kind of a. I could get them, but this is kind of a well-known fact. I mean, you, if who? you look at the manuscripts, you have a whole server full of them. They all have marks around John seven fifty-three. Well, yeah, so they, on, they have. They yeah, they they don't have those. They have like periods and stuff. Like for example, in asterisk, here, asterisk. Let me see. Daniel Wallace, Daniel Wallace, and some other scholars. Here, here. Let me show you. Doubt. Let me show you. So go to the debate evidence. Here, I'll ping you out the message. Um, let me see. All right, I think it's Papyrus sixty six. But if you go go to the top top uh row, go one one line down, you see where it says tie. Then there's like a peer, there's like a dot, right? If you go, this is common, right? It's just punctuation because if you go to the bottom, uh, of of the manuscript and you go one two three lines up, you'll see you can probably recognize Kai. That's the most known Greek word. But you see another dot there. That's just punctuation. You see over many, no, many of the about. gammas just, and many of the deltas that they put no, double okay, punctuation. Sorry, I have to cut you off. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the margins, they put asterisks next to them, right? Because of some factors, and I said the technical difficulties, I can't send them right now, but they are there. This is a well-acknowledged fact. I'm surprised you would contest that. Yeah, but Papyrus 66, Papyrus 39, and Papyrus 75 don't Wait, include... Hold on. Stop it's not your time to cross-examine. So, John... 753 in the Alexandria text, they have these asterisks next to the um, the verses, showing that the scribe did have knowledge of no, these they don't. The later ones as well. They right? don't. But anyway, we can carry on. No, they don't. We can carry on. So, Show me. Yeah, they don't. So, papyrus so, 66, Papyrus 75. Said, Hold on, don't include... This is not how you cross examine it. Alright, my bad. I'm new to this. So, so some old Latin manuscripts, right? You said they don't include it, right? Mm -hmm. But as I said, Beze, which is the Western text type, and it's the earliest one. Bart Ehrman even says it's one of the earliest witnesses that we have includes it. And other old Latin manuscripts and codices. Palatinus, Beze, Colbertinus, Corbeniensis, Sarsenensis, Versenensis, and Redigoranus. They all include, include the pericope. So appealing to the old Latin text is kind of strange. And then, um, yeah, so are you aware that the, the old Latin does include this in many manuscripts as well which which ones because if you go to the, the earliest if you go to the earliest gospel manuscript of the vulgate it doesn't include the pericope no the vulgate is included in the pericope no, in, in codex in codex hold on, hold on a second, hold on oh a second. so saint God. jerome's vulgate which is the oldest vulgate he says very clearly that he revised the the Latin translation according to the most ancient Greek and Latin copies, which, by the way, you have not addressed, because if they are ancient for him and there are many, then they instantly outweigh the Alexandrian text type, and they could even be Alexandrian manuscripts himself, since he was in Bethlehem and he uh, met Didymus, right? But anyway, he says that the um, the oldest manuscripts, Greek and Latin that he had, they all included, the, he said that he revised the Gospels according to those, and he includes the pericope in the Vulgate. So he saw the Vulgate as being in those manuscripts, otherwise he wouldn't have included it. And he, it is in his earliest Vulgate, you're just factually in error there. So what's your question? Yeah, so my question is, what do you say to St. Jerome, who says that in ancient manuscripts for him, the most reliable, that, you know, the ones that he used to revise the uh, Vulgate, why would he include the pericope in his Vulgate if it was not found in these manuscripts? Yeah, I would say to him, that. I would say to him, for ancient copies for your friend Didymus, in the Alexandrian text type, they don't include it either, right? So we could just go back and forth about manuscripts, but at the end of the day, I would agree with you, the Latin is where it seems to have arisen. The fourth century is where the pericope, uh, per the pericope seems to have arisen. I didn't make that point. What do you mean you agree with me? I believe it's from Saint John. But anyway, let me just make the point. No, I, I meant, I meant, I, I agree with you like that. It's ancient copies, right, of the Latin, right? I would agree, but still, it's written in Greek. All right, that concludes. Wait, sorry, my. Uh... Oh, okay, I didn't hear the last response, but well, because family came in. All right, well, I'll give time for Anders to repeat it then.
Hmm? Said I'll give it time for Anders to repeat it. Repeat what? Xavier said, Xavier said he didn't hear your last response. Oh, yeah, I, I said, I would ask Didymus, your friend, Jerome's friend, your friend Jerome, I would ask Didymus, why do your most ancient copies not include it? Right? I would ask the same thing to Tertullian. As I said. And all the Alexandrian fathers. I would ask them now, why don't your earliest manuscripts include it? Right. Now we're Can I respond to that? Or... Okay, well. Uh, you can, yeah. Yeah, as I said, the elections, which is why it was not included in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, but Didymus, who's also an Egyptian, clearly said that it existed. Jerome, who clearly had more access to the most ancient manuscripts than we do because, you know, manuscripts wear away, he says that he revised the Vulgate according to the most accurate manuscripts and the, 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 the pericope was found in many Greek and Latin ancient manuscripts, which is why he included it. So, I mean, you haven't really addressed it. You'll just say, oh, well, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus don't have it. It's like, yeah, we know that, but that's not the point. Anyway, I don't want to... I did address it, but whatever. We're going to begin Anders's part of the cross-examination, so this is his first part. So once this is over, he'll have 20 minutes left, or they'll have 20 minutes left, I should say. So, Anders, whenever you're ready, let me know, and whenever you start speaking, I'll start the timer. <clears throat> okay, so you talked about um, asterisks in the earliest um, Alexandrian manuscripts. Um, like, which ones? Like, I, I understand some scholars say there's, like, a, a gap or something in Vaticanus, which, even if there is, that doesn't prove anything, but which ones? Like, show me one in Papyrus 66, Papyrus 75. I sent the images and debate evidence, so you should should be easy, but I would ask you, which ones have asterisks? Yeah, I mean, I could pull them up specifically right now, but James Snap notes a lot of them. But whilst you're pulling that up, you can carry on. No, I, I'd, I'd like to wait. You're going to waste your cross-exam time? You know, I could just sit here the whole time and not pull them yeah. up, so like you don't have them. I mean, okay, well, I'm not going to do that, but all right. Give me a few minutes then, because I'm going to pull them up. You can waste your time if you want. All right. Skip ahead. So nice because the point of the inclusion of the pericope. Um, This is a terrible idea for you, but all right, I'm I'm almost there. Uh, Well, it's just good right here. Yeah, um, uh, I'll clarify. Papyrus 66 and Papyrus 75, right? The papyri manuscripts I included. I sent the images and debate evidence, so you don't. I don't think you have to look it up. But how much time do I have? I mean, you asked me to look it up. What do you mean I don't have to look it up? Have six minutes and fifty seconds left. All right. You know, I'll just continue with my next question because why not? Um. So if if Jerome said that he used ancient Greek copies, 
but those same ancient Greek copies that we have access to demonstrate not to have the pericope, um, then why would you, what, what's your reason for accepting Jerome's claim of only consulting Greek copies if we have access to the most ancient Greek copies that he would have used that don't include it? Yeah, so we have access to like uh, six of them that are particularly ancient. If St. Jerome was speaking of many, then he was speaking of more than six, so it outweighs them. Yeah, but like, why? Why would you believe his claim if we don't have many? Of the well, because, because we have wide attestation to it being known in the East and West. As I said, the Didascalia Apostolorum, Didymus, those are Eastern. We have Ambrose, Passion, and others in the West. So clearly it's a very well-known story in St. John's Gospel. So there's no reason to believe it's not authentic. Coupled with lectionary... Um, what's it called? Lectionary thingies. All right, well, that would bring me to my next question. What makes you think that Byzantine lectionaries are going to affect Alexandrian lectionaries? And also, yeah. uh, a sub-question to that is, um, why do you think that the scribes would have been ignorant, even though, because they're in the Library of Alexandria, they would have had access to a lot of manuscripts? Why would they have One been... One question at a time. One question at a time. Okay. Whatever. But, first of all, before you... Can I answer your question before? So, yes. Um, Vaticanus contains umlauts uh, at the end of John 21 as well, noting that, you know, because sometimes it was moved there. That's why I, uh, I was looking for, I was looking through my notes and stuff now, but I mean, I didn't think you'd ask me for that on the spot, but whatever. But yeah, it includes that at the end of uh, Vaticanus there as well. well I, I, said, pull up, I said this the papyri. Is, this is quite a well known. I said the papyri. Uh, that's an arbitrary standard. But anyway, what, what was your question that you just asked again? Can you right. repeat it very quickly? My quick? question, honestly, I don't. Wait. <laughs> Forgot, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said. Uh, oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. Lectures. Yeah. So, so why do you think Byzantine lections would affect Alexandrian lections? Yeah, because we know that first of all, the East was much more. Uh, you know, they were they were more in union when it came to liturgy than you know. But anyway, we know that the Byzantine text type influenced the Alexandrian text type because there are Byzantine readings in the Alexandrian texts. So clearly, it's very possible that a Byzantine manuscript was in Egypt. Well, couldn't and that an just be scribe used it as his exemplar? Couldn't that just be um, due to eclecticism, meaning like a combination of the of the texts? Because, for example, right, but that... Codex Codex uh, Beze is uh, it, it includes. It's like, for example, it's it's Alexandrian in Revelation, I believe, but then it's uh, Byzantine in, in all other parts. Like Codex Alexandrinus is Alexandrian in the Gospels, but then it's Byzantine everywhere else. So could that just be due to eclecticism? Yeah, but they would have still been using Byzantine exemplars or something with Byzantine derivative in it. So that's how the influence would have been there. Okay, I don't understand, but okay. Um, and that Can leads... you explain? No, it's fine. We can save it for after because I probably have like one minute, ten seconds. But, um, uh, what was my next question? Oh yeah, if the people at Alex who were copying at Alexandria, which was a huge library before it got burned down, and and they had a lot of access to a lot of manuscripts, and they were they weren't monkeys, they weren't stupid, right? Uh, they weren't robots who just you know copied the text from one manuscript. They would have actually cared about the text because it was controlled. Um. Why do you think that they would have, um, you know, just left it out if they would have clearly seen, oh, this is uh, left out due to lections because Papyrus 66 and 75 and 39 aren't lections. There's no evidence for that. They don't have lectionary, like, uh, marks and stuff, so. Yeah, so it's not that they were stupid. The point is they were not stupid. They were good scribes in many cases, so they saw these marks. So then why'd they leave it out? the Pentecost... Because they saw the marks and they misunderstood them. So what, what manuscript had the mark? Which one? What's it classified as? You just asked that question. No, I didn't. <laughs> that was your first question that I spent, like, I was looking through my notes. No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. I mean, what was the exemplar that they copied from that yeah, had we, we marks? That's the whole point. This is, this is the whole point of textual criticism. We don't have the exemplars. Okay, so then, so then how need, do you know it was need, a lecture? Need, let me finish my point at least. So we need to, fin we need to come up with a, a theory that explains the textual tradition. So if the theory is that this was a made-up story and it found its way into basic a lot of other places except Alexandria, 
rather than it was in the original autographs and was removed in Alexandria, we need something to explain that. So we know from the lection readings from St. Pelagia's feast day and from the Pentecost reading that there was a certain lectionary cycle that would make it very easy, specifically the Pentecost lection, that would make it very easy to just see these marks and remove yeah, them. Yeah, but that's Byzantine, because not the overwhelming positive evidence. The overwhelming positive evidence is in support of this being ancient. So if Alexandria doesn't have it, then maybe we should rethink Westcott and Hort's thesis that Alexandria is the best and we can't go against Alexandria and so on. Well, it is, but whatever. Um, my final question would be, why would John Christosom, if, if this is uh, widely accepted, why would John Christosom and Origen, um, and uh, I believe uh, Cyprian as well, why would they not include it in their commentaries? So. Cyril, yeah, sorry, Cyril. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, you already asked that. I already responded in my response. No, I didn't. But yeah, what do you so mean? John Chrysostom, I mean, you, you made the point and I responded. But J John Chrysostom, uh, he was clearly just using a text that was influenced by the Alexandrian text type. I mean, the same could go against why does Jerome in Bethlehem no, say he's that Byzantine. many ancient... He's Byzantine. Yeah, but I said he was clearly using a text that was influenced by the Alexandrian text. And um, why, why would St. Jerome in Bethlehem, why would he... Uh, say that there are many ancient Latin and Greek manuscripts, and he knew Didymus that contain the pericope. You know, it could just it, it it's it's very clear. Well, which this way isn't your time to ask going. me questions, but whatever. It's a rhetorical question. I'm pretty sure I already answered it in my closing, but whatever. How much time do I have, Popatachi? You have about twenty seconds left. Okay. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any more questions. We can save it for afterwards. They take too long. Right. Now we're going to be beginning Xavier's portion. So, Xavier, uh, just let me know when you're ready, and I'll start the timer as soon as you start speaking. All right, I'm ready now. So, Anders, since uh, we do have to explain the data that we have, and you haven't really, you've just said it's not authentic, what is your position? What are the origins of the pericope? Yeah, I would say that it's it's. I have many theories. One theory I would accept is is probably the one that Bart Ehrman gave, um, which I know it's Bart Ehrman. It sounds whatever, but um, it, it sounds reasonable. Um, looking at the empirical evidence, we could see that it probably wasn't authentic, right? I've already demonstrated that. Um, I've seen your evidence, right? I'll put it to my. Uh, I'll yeah, put, put it to it my to thought, you. right? Um, but if it wasn't authentic, some scribe would have. Here's the first theory I have. Some scribe would have put it in the margins. And then some other scribe would have accidentally, um, because the Western Byzantine scribes are more sloppy, right? The Western text type, like uh, Codex D or Beze, um, you see this within it because, for example, like they'll, they'll just interpolate stuff. Way. I don't agree with that, but carry on. Yeah, but, but anyways, um, one scribe just, you know, saw it in the, in the margins and they thought it was part of the text, so they just added it. That's one theory. Another one is... Um, I would say this is the reason why it sort of uh, was floating around. That's why it's in uh, many Gospels. It's in the Gospel uh, of Hebrews. Just think on that for now, because you said that's the most probable. So, so no, I didn't. Since someone wrote it down, right? They like supposedly wrote it in the marginal note. Did, what, what, what is the origin? Did someone just make up the story, or was it... No, the that's, story that's what, that's what, what my next theory... I was actually about to explain in the, in the second theory that I might accept. It could have okay. been... It was definitely, I believe it happened to an extent, or I don't think it happened exactly how John wrote it, or exactly how we have quotes of it by Papias and, um, and, and, and others. <laughs> no. Yeah, kind of. Um, but I would say it's sort of a mixture of oral tradition and, and, um, and just like, uh, Lucan, it has many Lucan verbs and adjectives in it, so I would say it's sort of, it's probably an oral tradition that came from Luke, or something like, something like that. That's why it's in many Gospels. Um, so well, yeah. it's not in many gospels. Yeah, that, but, that's uh, that's what Didymus the Blind says. No, he says yeah because he's speaking about copies of gospel. Anyway, we can move on. So you said that it's uh it's a story that uh, was written down and it's an oral tradition. It may have happened in some way, but like, I just want to ask, what kind of floating anecdote begins with the words? But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and then it's yeah, I would say that, that that would have probably been added by a scribe. <laughs> What's the evidence for that? Yeah, the fact that the Western Byzantine texts have so many interpolations. Okay, so you're saying that uh, according to you, the Western text is bad. Yes. Therefore, this specific part must be interpolated. Yeah. 
you realize that's not a positive evidence claim? Well, yeah, there's more evidence. That's what I was explaining throughout the entire okay, so can you give Can you give me the evidence that the specific part of the peri so-called pericope that says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, which is basically all of them, can you show me that's an interpolation? Yeah, well, um, I can, and I would appeal to the Family 13 manuscripts, which, yes, are uh, they are late, but they don't include verses um, 53 through verse 1. Um, but again, it's like, yeah, that's, that's sort of, that's, well, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I want to make one more point. That's sort of like me asking you, show me the exemplar of Papyrus 66 to prove that it was election, right? You can't do that. You don't have access to it. So we don't have the first manuscript that would have had the interpolation. Not what I'm asking. No, you're making a claim that there is an interpolation. So you have to show yeah. the evidence for that because there is no positive. And you're saying the Western manuscripts, uh, the Western type, text type is, uh, yeah, is uh, the words... according to you, does not prove that. Because the same way I could say to you that saying the Alexandrian text types are generally reliable does not prove everything in it is reliable. Of course, that's a ridiculous statement. You have yeah, to but go the on words... a case basis. The but words... Anyway, we can, we can move on. Well, can, can I say one, can I say one more thing? You haven't brought any positive evidence for that. Can I say, no, can I say one more we, thing? We need to move on, we need to move on, right. So Why? Because I'm going to demonstrate how... How, how did it end... How did, how did the per, so-called pericope end up in the Gospel of St. John? Um, Because it was flowing, they just decided to put it there. <laughs> just randomly, they just put it in the middle... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to that. In the middle of the Gospel for no reason, basically. Yeah. Even though like, these were meticulous bishops who died protecting the yeah. the Bible manuscripts and were burned alive, they just put it there for no reason. Yeah, well, I could say the same for the Alexandrian. The ones who don't quote it, they died for you know their faith, but they didn't include it. Okay, but they put it there for no reason apparently. But like, um, if that's the case, like, what's what's the evidence that uh, they put it there for no reason when we have positive evidence that? It was rather there, and it got moved around because of elections. Can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't understand. Okay, since apparently, according to you, they just put it there for no reason, which is pure speculation based on nothing, by the way. Um, I want to know that what's the evidence for that, considering the fact that we have positive evidence that it started there, regardless of whether or not you think it's authentic, we have positive evidence that it started there, then was subsequently moved around because of electionary readings. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, what's the, is that the question? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I would, just say, I, do, I would just say when it comes to the, like the transition, it just fits in. But again, some manuscripts what? include it at Luke 21, 38. No, I asked for the evidence, not speculation. Evidence for what? That it was, it's just randomly put there. Considering the fact we have evidence yeah, the against fact, that, the that fact that, that randomly put there yeah, the fact, there. yeah. Let me answer the fact that Didymus says it's in many gospels. You can say that's that's he's talking about copies, but you have to prove that, right? You have to give me another citation from him where he says many gospels, and it obviously means um may, many manuscripts, right? Um, also the fact that many late manuscripts who would be copying early exemplars from like the 5th century and such, like Family 1 and Family 13, moved it around to places like John 21, 25, Luke 21, 38 and such. Um, so yeah, that's, I feel like that's sufficient yeah, I'm, enough I'm, evidence. I'm very, first of all, with the Didymus thing, you keep repeating yourself on that point, but the, the, the manuscripts that move the Gospel of John to the end of the Gospel of John, are you aware that some of them, I could pull up the specific yes, ones. Yes, I, I understand. If, I understand if, what no, you're going to say. Yeah. They, that, they know that this. Yes, they yes, yes, this I understand. Like, like, like unseal. Yeah, yeah, like, okay, like, like unseals one. Point. Yeah, yeah, I know. Because... Well, I know what you're going to say. I, I know. Yes, I'm okay, aware. This is for the audience as well. You have to let me finish my point. So, yes, those say, they, those note that this exists in other manuscripts. And the reason that they move it there is because. Um, they found some codices that don't have it, then they realize, oh wait, this is part of the election, this is part of our tradition, even though it's not commented on by some fathers, so they include it there. So it's not evidence against it. There are reasons that it moves. It rather so then... we see it moving from we move we see it moving from where it originally was, John seven and eight, to the end of the gospel or to a few verses before or after. We never see it randomly floating around and ending up in this place. And yeah, I mean it's just like you, the, the the idea that the beginning started with but Jesus went to a mount of others as a forgery is I don't know any scholar or any evidence for that. So it's kind of just an Anders theory that you made up. 
No, I, I gave you I cited manuscripts, but again, in loot some some manuscripts put it to uh, manuscript. Okay, which manuscript does not include uh the pericope with the words um uh... which manuscript has the pericope the, without the, the entirety of family word, thirteen the entirety of family thirteen. No, they all include the words but Jesus went to a mount of others. No, I I'm talking about verse verse fifty three. Like... Maybe very few. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about it starting with the words, but Jesus went to the Mount Oh, of it doesn't Generally, even start with that's that. What's included. It doesn't start with that. It starts with verse 53. What do you mean? John 7 53 says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. No, that's John 7 or John 8 verse 1. John 7 53 says they each they went oh, yeah. to his eating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, 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 the you know, what kind of, what kind of, uh, what kind of story starts with those words? Like, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the you stories know, they and all... They went home and then Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Yeah, Luke twenty one thirty eight. It says, and all Luke the people... 21. It says, and early in the morning, all the people came to, him, to the temple to hear him, right? That's why some manuscripts put it in there, because no. it seems like a good good place to fit this... Uh, but that's not anecdote. the beginning of a... That's not the beginning of an anecdote. That's the end of a scripture passage, not the beginning of an anecdote. Yeah, well, an end, and the end of a scripture passage, it could easily just be placed in there. But I am I lagging? Am I lagging? Um, no. Hello. 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 <sighs> Wait, Povatachi, I have a question. How many more of these are we doing? Hello. Hello. Am I lagging? Am I lagging? Yeah, how much, I can hear you how much time does he have left? He has about. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Bro, yeah, he just left. <laughs> uh, we'll wait for him. I uh, pause this time. All right, good. All right. Here, he's here. I'll invite him up. Right, Xavier, uh, for reference, because you were lagging for a bit there, you now have a minute and ten seconds. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that again. My internet is not good right now. But um, yeah. Uh, could you carry on what you were just saying, Anders? Well, I don't um, even what, remember. What I said, what I said very quickly was that you, what you referenced was the end of a scripture passage, not the beginning of a so-called anecdote. So how would that make any sense? Oh no, I was saying, I was saying, wait, let me just was... that just shows the that just shows the absurdity of your view because you're quoting the end of a passage and saying, oh well, this sounds like the beginning of John eight. No, that's that not. No, like this, no, 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 hang on, hang on. Absurd. You must understand what I did. I meant you can place a passage after after a transitional phrase. It's commonly done yeah but if it's a if it's a, a a floating anecdote why would you have a transitional phrase at the beginning it doesn't make sense because it's, it's a like new saying, story that's okay, why it's I'm called the, pericop right the, per the uh, pericope because it's a story it's gonna have a beginning yeah that's what you think i'm gonna make a no, that's what i know that's what it right says now. all right so um everyone went home and then anders woke up anders went downstairs and he had breakfast and he said hello to his parents that's a floating story. Would would you would anyone believe that that's a floating story? It starts with a transitional phase. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, of course it's gonna start with a transitional phrase. It's it's a it's a new pericope. But again, I didn't get to touch on the oh, fact okay. that I don't think you, it well. being it being placed between verse fifty two and verse twelve interrupts the flow of John's story. I didn't get to touch on no, that. I already moment. addressed that. I already addressed that. It showed the opposite. Huh? Maybe yeah. the time is now up. All right. So we're going to yeah, be moving on to Anders' second section of the cross-examination. Now this will be the last section of the cross-examination. After this, we're going to have a short five-minute intermission. So Anders, whenever you're ready, let me know, and I will start the timer. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready whenever you are. All right, so my first question to Xavier would be, um, in, in John chapter 8, um, Verse 9, it says, Jesus was left alone with the uh, woman standing before him, so there's no one else there. But then when it transitions from verse 11 to verse 12, it says, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. So who's he speaking to if he's alone with the woman? And there's no transition in between these um, phrases. Yeah, good question. So uh, in verse 2, we read that Jesus, early in the morning, came again into the temple and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught him. And then the Pharisees brought the woman, and then the... Uh, yeah, but the verse 9 says that they were happens. alone, meaning there's mono in Greek, meaning there's no one else. Right, but obviously it's not literally alone because the woman is with him. So it's very clear that the Pharisees were the ones who... Left. Yeah, but in John, the, the in John who, 17... The ones who were in the crowd remained. In John 17... 
All right, it doesn't say that one, but in John 17, 3... It doesn't say that. They didn't leave. They didn't go anywhere. He All was right, teaching hang on, them. hang on, hang on. This is, I get to ask you questions, right? But in John, in John 17, 3, it says, um, Mano, you are the only true God. Only, meaning nothing else, right? No one else. So if it says only... There's no exceptions that excludes everyone else. So who's he talking she says to? The woman was right there. Yeah, but when it says Jesus spoke to them, Alton and Are you Greek... saying like Saint John contradicted himself in one sentence and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst? Does that mean that the woman yeah, was Yeah, well that there? that's the only no, exception. It tells us the exception. That's but ridiculous it, because it never, the other people didn't it never says say that. Oh, it never says that the other people You're didn't leave. Than this, Anders. You're than this. It never says that the people didn't leave. It says again Jesus spoke to them after it says he was alone with the woman. The only exception it makes is the woman. Okay, why would they leave if they didn't accuse the woman? The Pharisees accused the woman. I don't know. You you should ask John who wrote this. I, I, I think the answer is they didn't leave because it's a ridiculous idea. No, they did leave. That's why it says Jesus was alone with the woman. That's the only exception. Yeah, so so who's Jesus? Who's Jesus speaking no to? Yeah, the people who he was teaching. Which was who? The scribes who left, right? It says everyone, everyone left, except yeah, for the woman. It says he was teaching people in the temple. It, you know, people. It could have had some scribes and Pharisees. It doesn't doesn't um, say it just as people. And then it says the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. So if you believe all of the Pharisees at one time in all of Jerusalem were with Jesus at that time, then, uh, I mean, yeah. You yeah, but verse 9 says, actually. when they heard it, they went one by one, beginning with the older ones or beginning with the elders, meaning all of the scribes and Pharisees left except for Jesus and the woman. So who yeah, is he speaking to? to accuse the woman. Who is he speaking to in verse 12 if they all left? I've, you're just asking the same question over and over. No, you didn't answer it. You're just saying, oh, well, well it the doesn't, there's, it's an to... exception, except the only exception it makes is for the woman. The people who he was talking to that, that never It left. says that they left. It says they left one by one, beginning with yeah, the, the elders. Yeah, the Pharisees and scribes who brought the woman. Yeah, and you just said that the scribes yes, and Pharisees yes, exactly. were... Yes, Okay, so if Jesus is alone with the woman, with the woman is the only exception. If he's alone with her, who is he yeah, speaking to? Over over Alright, well, this is just going to be a big circle, so we'll move okay, on. Okay, so I, I just want to make the point, address what you just said there. So, if you're going to use that argument and remove the pericope, then what you have is the, the Pharisees in a private meeting, and then immediately, somehow, they teleport in John uh, 8, verse 12, and Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world, and then the Pharisees respond and say, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. So you have a bigger problem. No, I don't. That that makes sense because it says in verse forty five, yeah, so the you officers. Were in a meeting and they just teleported. That well, no, it sense. doesn't because because in verse forty. Oh, it, it doesn't make sense. No, okay, okay, carry on. No, I never said that. You're twisting my words now because you have no hope. Anyways, I'll move on to the next question. Um, what makes you think that the Byzantine manuscripts are more reliable than the Alexandrian text type? I would just say that the fact that scribes in the ancient world were not fools and that's the one that they copied extensively we have far more byzantine manuscripts than alexandria yeah but isn't the main that's rule we don't right it's 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 isn't the main rule it's not about the quantity of the manuscripts it's about the quantity of uh the text itself meaning like how quality. much of the early text we have quality yeah, quality so quality just... and quantity yeah, so you just uh, presupposed a bunch of stuff. So Westcott and Hort's rule that manuscripts and, uh, you know, Daniel Wallace and other people as well, man quote unquote, manuscripts are weighed, not counted. Really, they don't, they, they don't really care about weight. It just means whichever ones are not Alexandrian, we don't like. But anyway, that's the claim. It's not based on anything. You have no, to even, prove even first. Even Byzantine. Wait, hold on, hold that's, on. that's what you James Snap prove... says too. Wait, let me finish. You have to prove first. I agree with you that we should weigh the manuscripts, but we have you have to prove first that the Alexandrian ones are the most reliable. And to say that they're shorter, and because uh, it's uh, because scribes usually add stuff than remove stuff, which is completely false. This was Westcott and Hort's theory. James no, Royce there's evidence of it. Wait, wait, let me finish. James Royce has completely decimated that lie and shown that scribes far often remove things and they add things. Yeah, well then, so so why are there so it's, many it's, more it's variants? Like, let me, let me why are there so many more variants between the critical text and the King James? Okay, let me give you an example, right? So it's like a sh I'll answer that by the way. It's like a ship uh, going through a storm and losing its hull versus a, a ship going through a storm and catching some branches on it, right? 
we, we can't just presuppose the okay, one so, that's so why are there so the many more structure. variants between if the scribes did mess up and add stuff and subtract stuff why are there so many I variants okay then what did you yeah. say I'll, I'll look back at the footage afterwards but what did you say yeah i said that it is much easier for a scribe to omit things than to add them james royce has shown that very clearly that was Westcott and Hort thought the opposite, and most scholars who followed them, like Bruce Metzger, Bart Ehrman, and Daniel Wallace, and I'm not disrespecting them, they are good scholars in their own right in some respects, they follow this theory, and it's not really, uh, doesn't really hold much water, because James Royce has shown the opposite. Why? I just answered that. Well, no, but if they give evidence, then why would you deny their so-called no. theories? James because Royce has given conclusive evidence. He's counted the manuscripts. He's shown like what? that omissions are far more common than additions. So well, think of this. We 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 can just survey a few off the top of our head. What are the three main New Testament additions? Obviously, there are more than three that people like. Maybe like you know, you can count them. They're not many. The three main additions are what the so-called pericope, the so-called longer ending of Mark, and First John five seven. Right? Those are additions. As for omissions, we can count countless because people's eyes skip words, they skip letters. Yeah, I would skip, agree, but we can know. also count many additions. Like for example, Matthew seventeen twenty one, um, in Matthew in 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 Mark seven sixteen, Mark nine forty four, Luke two thirty three, um, uh, John nine thirty eight. Right, we can count so many more. I don't agree with you necessarily that all of those are additions. Well, it, it doesn't deny, matter if you agree I, with me. It matters what I the evidence deny. says. I never denied that additions exist. Anyways, evidence, we can... Evidence is interpreted, and this is interpretation is not the only one. Anyways, okay. Uh, I'll move on to the next question, because at the end of the day, this is just... We're going in circles. Um, I, I guess... Yes, I guess my next question would be... Um, if you see... Why, why would you take the Byz, uh, Byzantine manuscripts as more reliable if you see, for example, in certain texts, um, like... Uh, um, in in the Alexandrian text, the earliest ones, um, they omit. I can hear myself. Wait, let me speak now. All right. Uh, they omit and adds, uh, or they they omit certain verses that the Byzantine manuscripts have. Like for example, um, in Mark one one, the term the Son of God, I believe, is is o omitted in many of the earliest manuscripts. But that's not a liturgical reading. So why would the Byzantine manuscripts add them? And another thing, why would the Western text, which you appealed to Codex Beze, Wait, which one is... at a time, one at a time. All right. So your first question, I never denied the variance. And right, this is not, this is about First John. I mean, not First John. This is about the so-called pericope. So going to other uh, variants is not, uh, unless it's like related. Not well, that's really what you helpful. did for Second Peter yeah, I mean, one one. You, you brought up Second Peter one one in Codex Sinaiticus, but yeah, okay, that was whatever. Just... That was related, and I brought it up very briefly. Anyway. But well, this is also there related. Is in all manuscript, right? So saying that this, oh, this has a variant, therefore it's unreliable. There are variants in the the Alexandrian I never said that. Types. I was asking you. You're not answering use. my question. There are variants in the Alex Wait, there are, there are, there are Yes, I understand, but there's the less variants. No one uses. I understand. No uses I understand, but right. you didn't answer my question. So I'll ask it. Point. Uh, uh, no, I'll ask it again because you didn't answer. For verses that are included in the Textus Receptus, which is like the critical text essentially for the Byzantine manuscripts, um, if it's transmitted accurately, why do the earliest manuscripts, um, the earliest attestations not include many of the verses that are in the Textus Receptus? Yeah, I'm not a Texas Receptus only yes, but I will just say, for example, we can go on we can go on a case by case basis. I've made a case here for why specifically the so called pericope was removed from um, the non Byzantine and Western text types. I've made uh, and we can we can do this for other things as well. Mark sixteen I nineteen through twenty, I also believe that's authentic, but that's not that's not the topic of the debate. Oh, uh, so how does that answer my... Okay, whatever. <laughs> Alright, Popatachi, how much time do I have? Uh, you have just five seconds left, so... Alright. Yeah, I'll just say that it did answer his question because his question is why does no, why do why do some things in the uh, in the why are some things in the Texas receptors that are not in the Alexandrian? No, the I, I said I said when it comes basic. to some of them, some of the variants or uh, things that are the found in the Texas receptors that aren't in the Alexandrian text, none of them have anything to do with lectionaries. What do you say? Time is up for the. I said the time is up for the cross examination. 
I will go give you guys a couple more seconds though, just to finish what you're saying. Yeah, so I'll I'll just say this. Um, my question wasn't about. Don't answer it now because it's it's relevant now. But I mean, I will make a quick comment. But go ahead. Okay, but what I was saying is this. I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't. I could care less about what the Texas Receptus says. But if you accept it, it's essentially the critical text yeah, for the business. Yeah, that's what the Alexandrian says. Yeah. Oh. 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 I I remembered what I was gonna say now. Um, when it comes to the Alexandrian, um, many of or actually all of the scribes, it, it was it was a controlled text, right? But the Byzantine has more variants. It has all of these additions and stuff. Why would there be? Why would I'm not done, bro? Oh my gosh, I can't. End. Uh, anyways, why would they? When it comes to you, you appeal to liturgical things, right? You appeal to um lections for the pericope, which I already responded to. You responded to as well, but we can talk about that later. Um, but when it comes to things that have oh, nothing, when it okay. when it comes to things, well, I already respond to it, but you're gonna say the same thing. So, but when it comes to the variants in the Alexandrian that are that are not found in the Alexandrian but are found in the Byzantine manuscripts universally, that have nothing to do with elections, why do you accept the Byzantine text over the Alexandrian text? Hey, you asked this question already, and you've gone no, over no. Your time, I, so I asked. Wait, hold on, hold right, on, hold whatever. on. You've gone over your time. Just, so just keep going. Clear. Just, just, just right, move on, Kobatachi. He's I not believe, understanding what I'm saying. I, I believe that some of these so-called additions, you're presupposing they're additions. I don't concede that. Like you're why? probably referring if the to earliest Mark manuscripts 16, don't include them, finish, why? You're referring to Mark sixteen nine through twenty, and no, uh, I'm not. Uh, and uh, I'm not. You know, other other things like like the so-called pericope. I'm yeah, not. Yeah, the earliest Alexandrian manuscripts don't include them, but we have historical attestation that they existed in many ancient Yeah, but just because just because they exist doesn't mean that it's authentic. Anyway, this is kind of extended. I don't know what's happening. His cross exam should be done. Just want to give you guys time to uh, finish up your arguments for the sake of being genuine. Well, we finished. It's them. at the end of the day, Popatachi. It's just going to be circles. Yeah. Okay, so I now we're going to so. enter the five minute intermission. So starting now, I'm going to set a five minute timer. Feel free. Yeah, we're going to have an intermission before the closing statements. So just wrap up. Wait, why? Your what? Resources, take a break. Why what? Yeah, but everyone's gonna leave if it's five minutes. I think we should just go to the closing statements, to be honest. I mean, if people can't last five minutes for their closing statements, then how much time would they have for them, you know? Okay, let's do one minute. We'll do five. Is that fine? I mean, I need five minutes for what I'm about to do That's... as well. And it's typically five minutes, so... Oh, well... Yeah. What is it? <laughs> you mud. I mean, someone else could mud or something. Like, what, is what is it? What is it, Popatachi? I mean, if he's AFK, should we just end this? And as I could do my closing, you can do your closing. No, no, no we should wait. Just, yeah, another mud for Just, you, just let him. I know what he's doing. Just let him. Let it's him gonna go. take five minutes. People are gonna leave. I didn't. What, well, I. It's fine. Save, if your attention span is that low, fine. We'll, we'll just it's not by it. about my attention, fan. People are gonna leave. This is not part of the debate format. I've done, I've done five minutes before, and they never leave. So, but all right, we can we can go ahead and do ten minutes. Or not ten minutes. Sorry, we can go ahead and just skip the intermission and go to the opening uh, closing statements. Not opening statements. All right, all right, Xavier, your closing statements first, whenever you're ready. Yeah. So I'll just recap very quickly and uh, address some of his tangential points. So Anders, the root of this debate is that Anders has taken a theory that uh, the Alexandrian text type is basically the end-all be-all and he's following the rule of Westcott and Hort, who, who you know, they, they were really the pioneers of this. They said basically, where Vaticanus and Sinaiticus disagree, it's not safe to go against that. Well, I'm proposing that maybe it is safe to go against that because these manuscripts are not perfect. There's a bunch of things in them that show like they are not, um, they are not, uh, what's it called? They're not pristine. Very clearly, we could see things like um, the Byzantine readings in their, their, um, some of the manuscripts, some of the Alexandrian text type manuscripts. We see their readings in the Alexandrian text type, I can pull them up, and literally no one follows. Like, so, so to say that they are really just these, uh, these pillars that we can't go against is really not based on anything, right? So there are clear 
errors in the Alexandria text type. This is related because the Alexandria text type omits John uh, 8. So, one of the errors is that Vaticanus and Tinaiticus openly contradict the Gospel of John because in Matthew 27 it says Jesus was pierced with a lance before he died. That's not in the Gospels. Like, that's made up. That's not in any... I don't know of any Bible translations that include that today. So there's clear mistakes in this, right? It's missing, they're missing words in John 9, the words, uh, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him, and Jesus said. Those are completely missing from P75, Codex Sinaiticus, and Codex W, right? Uh, Sinaiticus and Papyrus 75, others, they make a bunch of mistakes. So, sure, they are a witness to what the early church had in their Bibles, but this is not some kind of uh, uh, infallible standard that we, quote-unquote, can never go against. It's never safe to go against in the words of Westcott and Hort. Especially in the case of John 7, 50, uh, 53 to 8, 11, we have overwhelming evidence that this is ancient. The big, the big two here, Didymus and Jerome, of course, there are many other witnesses. I didn't have time to go through them all because this is only like an hour or something. St. Jerome says, I'm going to quote him again, in the Gospel according to John, there is found in many of the Greek as well as the Latin copies, the story of the adulteress who was accused before the Lord. He says it against the Pelagians 2.17. Right? And when he's revising his Vulgate, which includes the pericope, he says that he revised them by, by comparison of the Greek manuscripts only the early ones have been used. To avoid any great divergences from the Latin, which we are accustomed to read, I have used my pen with some restraint, and while I have corrected only such passages as have seen, as seems to convey a different meaning, I have allowed the rest to remain as they are, right? So, he's saying that, you know, there are some bad manuscripts, of course there are bad manuscripts in all ancient documents, but for him, he has compiled the most accurate that don't change the meaning, and he has included this. So clearly, if it was not part of it, this would clearly change the meaning, so he wouldn't have included it. So very clearly, St. Jerome is a powerful witness that the most ancient copies of Greek and Latin, Greek by the way, which is what the Alexandria text type is written in, include the so-called pericope, right? So it's really arbitrary to say that because it's not found in these few manuscripts that we really like and some modern scholars say we can't go against, um, whilst many others disagree with them, by the way, like Dr. Maurice Robinson, um, well, not many others, but yeah, there are some others. It's arbitrary. There's no reason to just say that we can't go against these because, uh, because you know, they are supposedly these uh, great infallible sources of what the apostles wrote. No, they clearly have many mistakes. I've shown that. Uh, Jesus was not pierced before he died. No one believes that. And that's what the Alexandria text type says. And there are other very early witnesses, as I said before, Codex Beze. It's a Western text type, so-called Western text type anyway. And Bart Abel says he agrees it's one of our oldest witnesses, even though, yes, of course, in some places it doesn't have the best reading. Likewise, the Alexandria doesn't have the best reading in some places, right? Um, it says very clearly that uh, it has the pericope in it, I mean. So, um, yeah, just in general, I think we really need to be careful what we do. If we blindly follow some people who are popular without really critically analyzing their arguments, we are not going to come to a safe conclusion on everything. Very simply put, Bart Ehrman is wrong, Bruce Metzger was wrong, and Daniel Wallace, who follows them, is wrong. Right? At least Bruce Metzger he follows. And then you, you come to like ridiculous phrases that some of these scholars make, like D.A. Carson. He, he's, he's probably guessing this from uh, Bruce Metzger and uh, Bart Ehrman's uh, introduction to this. He's probably guessing the idea that all of the so-called, all, so-called all of the church fathers omit this narrative, which is completely made up. It's not true. I showed many church fathers who speak of this. He probably was trying to quote them when they said all of the Greek ones uh, exclude it, which is wrong. Because Didymus, even though uh, we, if we speak of Church Father Lucy, we could say he is one, and the uh, Didiscalia Apostolorum, which is an early writing, they very clearly have this in their documents. So these scholars, they simply, probably out of ignorance rather than negligence, I mean, rather than malice, uh, don't include these. So yeah, I mean, it's just, I think the, the evidence is very clear in favor of the so called pericope. Um, Saying that it's not authentic is going to 
make you have a very hyper skeptical view of basically everything that any ancient writer said about any manuscript, which I get, I can guarantee that most people do not have. They probably just have it for this for their own reasons, theological or not. Right? And I think it's very clear, right, that you know this is part of Holy Scripture, this was inspired by the Holy Spirit, this was written by St. John, and unfortunately because of electionary readings, which I didn't get too much time to uh, touch on, Anders didn't really address that too much, um, because of the markings for the electionary readings, specifically the Pentecost election, with obviously St. Pelagius' uh, election within that, um, because of that, because of a misunderstanding of an overly meticulous Alexandrian scribe, those were removed from the Alexandrian text type and other textual traditions that are influenced by the Alexandrian text type. So this is by no means a, a uh, 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 I mean, these are by no means uh, the, the pillars of what was written by the apostles, because as I said, they clearly have omissions and errors in them. But of course, they are Bibles, they do contain most of what is uh, of the scriptures, but they do unfortunately admit this. And we have to take a, hol a holistic approach. We can't have this weird eclecticism where we just focus on these manuscripts. We have to look at what everyone had, at what was in the East, in Syria. Uh, we have uh, the Didascalia Apostolorum. In Bethlehem, we have St. Jerome, who knew Egyptians. So St. So Jerome is also a witness over the Alexandrian text type. Then we have the West. We have Codex Beze in the Western text types. And many of the Vetus Latina texts that include this, and we have St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, St. Passion, um, many other saints who quote this and subsequent to them, and this has always been received by the church. So we should receive it, right? And of course, as Catholics, we know that the Vulgate was received at the Council of Trent as well, so there's also a, uh, a positive case in that direction as well. So in conclusion, um, I will present the rest of my time after this, but I will just say that it's very clear that this was written by St. John from the evidence, and um, I think we can see, I'm not saying anyone in particular is stupid, but Anders said that whoever believes this is authentic is stupid. He has said that this was a floating anecdote that was randomly, for no reason, just put in the middle of the gospel. He literally said that. Now, anyone who's... Uh, uh, I feel like that's just insulting everyone's intelligence by saying that, frankly. I don't say that he's doing that intentionally, but it's ridiculous to say that with no evidence. But anyone with sense, common sense, could see that's clearly not the case, and can very clearly see which view is the stupid one. Thank you. I rescind my time. We're now going to be going into Anders's part of the closing statement. So, Anders, are you ready? Mm-hmm. All right, whenever you're ready to begin, just start speaking. Yeah, the evidence does not support the authenticity or the Johannine authorship of the uh, Pericope Adulterae. Um, that's why so many scholars nowadays, that's why you yourself said, um, not many others, right, You when, when you were referring to the Byzantine text, not many others accept it, right? Because scholars can identify what is the most authentic. You brought up Alexandrian manuscripts which I'll, I'll talk about a bit and then i'll do like a final conclusion i don't want to make this a rebuttal round um you talked about like the bean pierce thing yeah we can go to earlier manuscripts like papyrus 75 um to see what it would have said right um i agree john 938 is authentic um but it's an as noted by bruce metzger it's an accidental scribal omission from p75 um and sinaiticus and washingtonianus um because it's in um, Papyrus 66, which is earlier, and the evidence just points to the fact that John 938 is um, uh, authentic. Whether or not Jesus is worshipped there, we still know for a fact that he's worshipped elsewhere. Um, you ta uh, you brought up the, you keep bringing up Jerome, 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 and you didn't talk about how many other fathers like Christosom and, um, and Cyril and omit it from their, um, uh, fr from their um, commentaries, right? You keep saying like um like oh these fathers like accept it so therefore it's true, which that's not how textual criticism works. You take a look at the Greek, then you look at the other versions, then you look at the patristics. It's not the other way around. You don't put the patristics over the manuscripts. Um and the manuscript evidence supports for the omission. Um but when it comes to the lections, again, the Byzantine lections do not affect the Alexandrian lections. And if even if that is the case, I would ask you. Uh, I would, and everyone here who agrees with the Savior, I would ask you, 
why don't other parts why, why aren't other parts of all the early papyri and the great unseals why aren't they omitted with the lections why aren't they it's simple because the scribes aren't stupid they have access to many manuscripts and because of that they come to the conclusion oh this isn't authentic because we have the best manuscripts at the library of alexandria um uh, so yeah, the Alexandrian manuscripts are are authentic. They're more authentic than uh, the majority text. Um, so yeah, uh, what else? Oh yeah, you talked about Latin and Greek, which again, like I said, the oldest copy of uh, the oldest copy of of the Latin Vulgate, the oldest manuscript, um, does not include the pericope uh, of the Gospels. I mean, it does not include the pericope. Um, the the evidence supports that uh, decision made by the scribe. Um, that it does not uh, that it's not written by John it's not authentic um so yeah when when Jerome looks at uh ancient versions right the ancient Greek versions he would have used is just like codex uh, Sinaiticus and codex Vaticanus and p75 and p66 and p39 they're just like that because you want to know why Jerome for his for him saying they're ancient in the same way those manuscripts are ancient they would be considered ancient by him right so why don't you accept the fact of the omission? Because those ancient manuscripts that Jerome would have technically been calling ancient, they omit it. Um, not due to lections, but because of the fact that um, it's not authentic. Um, what else? Um, well, you brought up Bart Ehrman, whom I disagree with a lot. Um, what else? Um, oh yeah, so just because you just because a manuscript, you keep bringing up. Codex Beze, when it comes to like what what Bart Ehrman says about it, what many others say, um, you you stress Codex Beze, and you're saying because this manuscript has it, it's authentic. Because you're appealing to dating, because this manuscript, which Bart Ehrman, who's a terrible scholar, um, sometimes, but because Bart Ehrman says that this manuscript is authentic, um, right? Therefore, this supports the fact of the pericope being authentic when Bart Ehrman himself. Um, supports the Alexandrian text type over the Byzantine and Western text, and he also agrees that the pericope was not authentic. So I don't know why you're citing him, but just because you have a manuscript that includes the pericope, that does not mean that it is authentic. That's like me, for example, if an atheist said, says God doesn't exist because evil stuff happens, if I say, does that mean God does exist when good stuff happens, right? It's in the same way. If you say a manuscript includes it, therefore it's authentic. I can just say these manuscripts outweigh that one manuscript. These manuscripts don't include it, so therefore it's not authentic. Um, one final thing I'd like to say, it's not about what you think, right? It's about what the evidence says, and the evidence supports the omission of the pericope de Dautere.